So let me now tell you about this uh, discrete Fourier transform method for multiplying integers. <coughs> and uh, the idea is that uh, multiplying integers is basically the same problem as multiplying polynomials. So that's really the problem that we're going to solve. So recall we have uh, two capital N digit numbers. Let me call them capital A and capital B. And we want A times B. And I can write their digits. I can write them in like base N like this. Base little n like this. <coughs> Maybe I should add one more example here. This is a terrible choice. OK, that's what two generic numbers in base little n with capital N many digits look like. OK, the little a's and the little b's are the digits. And we, okay, we want to compute the product of these as numbers. And you can see it really looks as though we're multiplying two polynomials. So in fact, a is equal to p of n, where p is the polynomial, the formal polynomial in an indeterminate x with integer coefficients, you know, a n minus 1, x to the capital N minus 1. It's a1, x plus a0. And similarly, you know, this number b is q of n, where q of x is also a polynomial, but with the, like the b, b's as coefficients. <clears throat> OK, so think of these as now formal polynomials. And our goal in life is to compute uh, a times b. And that's um, r of n uh, when r of x is defined to be the product of p of x and q of x. OK, if we can formally re, you know, think of a, the product of these two polynomials, which is another polynomial in x of degree 2 capital N minus 2. and you know, if we know what that polynomial is, if we now plug in the number little n for x, then we get uh, p of n times q of n, which is a times b. So what I'm saying here is, and you know, the input to the problem of multiplying two integers are, is, by the way, these digits, a0 through an minus 1 and b0 through bn minus 1. And what we like to say is that um, suppose Given that input, we came up with uh, you know, the polynomial r of x, which I'll write as c 2n minus 2, x to the 2n minus 2, plus dot 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 plus c1 x plus c0. OK, somehow suppose we did this uh, polynomial multiplication. Then these. Uh, coefficients, ci's are, let me say, basically the digits, the base n digits of the thing that we're trying to figure out, a times b, this number. <clears throat> okay, there's a mild problem with this claim. Uh, what is this mild problem? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this would be exactly true if all of these coefficients were between 0 and n minus 1. Um, but they're not. Uh, there's a catch. There's like carrying, where like, you know, some coefficient might be like n squared, so it like overflows a little bit in some sense when you're reducing it to base n, like a few steps up. Uh, so there's like a catch, which is carrying. But it's a very mild catch, so uh, I will leave the following things to you as exercises. First, uh, each coefficient cj will be at most n cubed. Uh, and therefore, it will fit into like three words. I'm sort of assuming now that my words are, as I said, exactly log, log, two, log base 2 of n. 
And then it's like an exercise also for you that like um, you can do the sort of carrying and addition. in uh, order and time. So like linear time, which is negligible to what we're going for. Like basically what happens is you, you get a picture that sort of looks like this. Like C0 is maybe, this is somehow C0, is maybe three words long, and C1 is like maybe three words long, and C2 is up to three words long. OK, you kind of have to like add these up and like do like some carries to get the actual digits that are like between uh, 0 and n minus 1. Like imagine that like, you know, a digit was actually a digit, like a number between like 0 and 9. But like when you compute these coefficients, you got like, you know, 17 and you know, 36. Okay, then you have to like, you know, there's carries and additions to like actually get the digits that are all between 0 and 9. Okay, so this uh, is sort of recognized early on. It actually makes it look like uh, we've made the problem slightly harder, but it's just a bit cleaner to like formalize the problem as multiplying two integer coefficient polynomials and getting an integer coefficient polynomial. Okay, and then the carrying business is like a little twist at the end. <coughs> okay, so our goal is to uh, do this now. And that's what I want to, sh that's the main thing we're going to show. Our goal is to multiply two degree n polynomials. OK, really, they're degree n minus 1, but never mind. Uh, and, and let me be a little vague here, n log n steps. And continue to be a little bit vague. These are integer coefficient polynomials. But basically, now let's sort of move to counting like steps or arithmetic operations. I'll explain the little uh, annoyances about that at the end. But just assume you can do operations on like these coefficients in constant time for now. OK, and so now there's only one parameter, like capital N. You have two capital N degree polynomials, and you want to multiply them. OK, somehow this is all like throat clearing for the, the beginning of the real problem, which uh, is happening now. Uh, OK, so here's a, a critical idea for understanding the trick. And uh, this is like the most important fact about polynomials. We'll come up to it again when we study polynomials in greater detail in a later lecture. OK. Uh, I suppose they're actually degree n minus 1. I'll remember that because I want to say this. A degree n minus 1 polynomial, p of x, is specified by its n coefficients. Or, equally well, it can be specified by its value, values at n distinct points. OK, this is somehow like the most famous fact or important fact about uh, univariate polynomials. You know, uh, two points determine a line, and like three points determine a quadratic, and so forth. So uh, what we know is we sort of the input is the n coefficients of p and the n coefficients of q. And what we are trying to get out are basically the 2n or so coefficients of p times q. Uh, <clears throat> now, just going to show that you know, the representation of data makes a big difference. Suppose we could somehow say, like, well, I know p's value, or I know p's n coefficients, but let me just somehow imagine I also knew p's value on n points. And say we also got q's value on n points. Uh, let me even say we got them on two n points, just for um, redundancy's sake. Uh, 
OK, so say we knew, like, hypothetically and for example, we knew, like, P1 up through P2n, <coughs> and also Q1 through Q2n. Then we'd get uh, R of x's values on these same two endpoints really fast in, let's say, order n arithmetic operations. Because R is just P times Q. So like if we knew these two n numbers, and we knew these two n numbers, then like R of 1 would be P of 1 times Q of 1. Like we just do 1 multiply, and we just multiply each of these pairwise, and we know R's values on two n points. So if somehow we could always be working with like a values representation of the polynomials rather than like a coefficients representation, then multiplying two polynomials would be super easy. We could just like multiply pointwise, and it would be order n time, or n steps. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't uh, have these values representations. I mean, we're given the sort of coefficients representation of the polynomials, and we want to get the coefficients representation in the end. But we are going to try to pass through the, the values representation to get this trick, uh, to do this like fast multiplication trick. So in general, let's say you have n coefficients of s of x. Let's say s of x is a degree, I don't know, n minus 1 polynomial. You may have this. Or you may have like n values of s of x, like hypothetically s1, s2, s3, sorry, s of 1, s of 2, s of 3, up to s of n. And going from here to here is just, uh, this is called evaluation. You know, I sort of have a polynomial explicitly written out. I want to get its values. You know, I evaluate the polynomial. And going in this direction is called, in math, uh, interpolation. You know, if you have the values of kind of a mystery polynomial of degree n minus 1 on n points, you know, the n points and the n values, figuring out the polynomial that achieves those values is called interpolation. And the dream that will actually be fulfilled is to do both of these steps Evaluation and whoa. Evaluation and interpolation in order n log n. Again, let me just say operations. And if we could do this, if we had some sort of way of doing this, then we'd be in great shape because to multiply our two degree n polynomials in order n log n operations. We first do, we first evaluate them on 2n values, okay, and that is going to somehow miraculously take n log n time. And now we'll have, you know, p's values on 2n points, q's values on 2n points. Just we'll multiply these together pairwise in order n operations to get r's value on 2n points, where r is p times q. And then we'll appeal to this again and take r's value on two n points, do interpolation, and n log n steps, and get back r's coefficients, which is our goal. <laughs> Does that plan make sense? OK, so uh, okay, we just need to achieve this miracle, and we're, we're done. We get multiplication in linear time. Now, uh, the trouble is, if you try to do this naively, um, it seems that this evaluation, for example, should take quadratic time. I mean, if I think, you think you have like a polynomial of uh, degree n, and I want you to find its values on n different points. Well, to find its value on one point, it seems you have to like kind of plug it in, that point in for x, and like raise the powers and add. That should take at least n steps. And then you've got to do it for like n points, so that should probably take n squared steps. So. It seems ambitious to think you're going to do it in n log n uh, operations. Uh, but you can if you choose the cleverest choice of points to do it on. Don't choose like 1 through 
like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 2n. That's not the cleverest choice. See, we have a freedom. We can choose whatever points we want in this argument. So we'll choose the cleverest ones. And <clears throat> we're going to actually choose some uh, numbers to evaluate these polynomials on, such that in some sense there will be a lot of like a lot of like cost sharing when you're evaluating, let's say, a polynomial p on all these n points. Uh, so this cost sharing will somehow allow you to do it much faster than n squared operations. It'll allow you to do an n log n operations. Uh, okay, so. Let's think about this, and let's say we want to just do evaluation for now. Evaluation is sort of the easier one to think about. Uh, say we want to evaluate a polynomial at the points, you know, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n, let's just say omega 0, omega 1, omega 2, up to omega n minus 1, where these are some numbers to be chosen later. And if you've seen this before, it's not a coincidence that I use the letter omega. Uh, all right, so if this polynomial p of x looks like this, a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus dot, 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 plus a1, x1, oops, just x, plus a0. So they say this is our polynomial, and we want p's values on these n numbers then uh, to get those, it's actually a matrix vector multiplication problem, as I'll now illustrate. What I claim is we can get the vector of answers, p of omega 0, p of omega 1, down through p of omega n minus 1, as this matrix vector product where we, in the first right row, write the powers of omega 0. And in the second row, we write the powers of omega 1. In the last row, we write the powers of omega n minus 1. OK, and we multiply this big n by n matrix by the column of coefficients of p. OK, so it uh, looks a little bit complicated. But all I'm saying is, OK, given these fixed uh, desired evaluation points, if we make this uh, matrix, which contains all their powers, 0 through n minus first powers, which, by the way, is sometimes called uh, the Vandermond matrix associated to these numbers. I'll just say that for your own edification. It's not important. And you multiply that matrix by this column of coefficients, and you just see what you get. I mean, just you can visibly see, like, this row dot this column is p of omega 0 and so forth. Yep? Oh, yeah. Uh, we do eventually want to evaluate at two endpoints. Um, so, if you have a degree n polynomial and you want to evaluate at two n points, one thing you can do is just pretend that it's a degree 2 n polynomial where the top n coefficients happen to be 0. And then do this all with n replaced by 2 n. It's a good point. I should have said that. I'm actually doing the reverse. I'm just saying that like, well, let's pretend that like, it's always n, that, uh, n points and degree n that we want to do. Although you're right, it's actually going to be actually 2 n in the whole algorithm. But I'm just writing n here for simplicity. Uh, good. So uh, the task of evaluating the polynomial on these points is just the task of doing this matrix multiplied by this vector. And what's nice, let me call this matrix uh, just V. The reverse task, interpolation, you know, given the a polynomial's value on values on omega 0 through omega n minus 1, figure out its coefficients. It's just multiplication by the matrix V inverse. Assuming V has an inverse, which it will. Uh, so that's good. So I mean, it mainly lets us focus on you know, doing this kind of matrix multiply. And the same problem with V inverse is the uh, interpolation step. Now again, I mean, if you just have like a matrix 
n by n matrix times a length n vector seemingly takes like n squared operations to do it. But again, as I said, the, the trick will be to choose like very clever um, values for these omegas such that there's like a lot of cost sharing and you can actually do this matrix multiply in n log n steps. And okay. Um, to somewhat, you know, cut a long story short, I mean, one thing that would certainly help is if a lot of these numbers were the same, <coughs> these powers were the same, okay, and so you want some numbers where, like, powers of them are, like, equal to each other. You know, long story short, the, the clever choice of omegas are uh, complex roots of unity. Okay, so we got to bring complex numbers into the picture, but that's okay. They're enjoyable. So let's do that. So I'll remind you, these are the complex numbers. The circle represents all the complex numbers of magnitude 1. That's 1. That's i, etc. Uh, and what you do is you take uh, omega j, the jth number, just to be, this is going to be a little bit confusing, but omega to the j, where omega is like a primitive capital Nth root of unity. And just to be consistent with like everybody else's notation, uh, I actually mean this one. Normally, this one is like considered the primitive Nth root of unity. But uh, just to be consistent with everybody's notation, I'll choose the other one. So this e to the minus 2 pi i over cap 2n. OK, so this is omega. And like, uh, this is omega squared. This is omega cubed. This is omega to the fourth. I guess in my example here that I'm drawing, n is 16. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then omega to the 16 is 1, which is also omega to the 0. Great. So uh, with this choice of omegas, I mean, so you fix n, then you let uh, omega, just plain omega, be the nth root of unity. And then you let your uh, jth interpolation or evaluation point be the, the jth power of this omega. Those will be your n points. <coughs> uh, and when you plug them into this matrix with this specific choice, the resulting matrix is called the discrete Fourier transform matrix. Well, the n by n one. And so really, right, this is, uh, OK, so omega 0 is just 1. So actually, when we do this, the first row is all 1s. OK, then the next row, like, omega 1 is just omega. So it's like omega, omega squared, up to omega n minus 1. The next row is like the powers of omega squared. So it's 1, omega squared, let's see if I get this right, omega fourth, omega sixth, etc. OK, and in general, the k elf entry of this matrix is omega to the k uh, to the l. So omega to the k times l. And uh, you can also take this modulo n, right? Because the powers of omega like uh, repeat once you go, uh, well, mod n once you go like past n. OK, and that's actually kind of nice because like a priori, there could be like n squared different numbers in this matrix. But since you can reduce all the exponents mod n, there's at most like n different numbers in this matrix, which is how you potentially can get some like, at least start to imagine getting some like cost savings in doing this matrix vector multiply. Yep. Um, the definition of omega, where does the i come from? Oh, this is just like the math way to write this complex number. Uh, so. If you don't like this, or if you forget about complex numbers, it's just the complex number, which has like magnitude 1, and its angle from the origin is negative 1 over negative 2 pi over 2n. Like minus, wait, this should be over n. Sorry, maybe this was your question. It should be over n. So it's like, thanks. It's like 1 nth of the way around the circle. Thank you, that was confusing. Okay, 
so I tried to write an explicit example here. This is an n equals 8, except it was, uh, I didn't want to write like all the omegas. This is dft sub 8. So really, like when I write 6 here, it's really omega to the 6. And when I write like 4 here, it's really omega to the 4. And this is when omega is like the 8th root of unity. So omega is this. It's at like negative 45 degrees from the real axis. So omega, omega squared is minus i, and so forth. And uh, what we're going to eventually see, I'll come to this uh, soon enough, but uh, what we're going to see is that with this beautiful choice of numbers, there exists an algorithm, the fast Fourier transform algorithm, for doing this matrix vector multiply in n log n steps rather than n squared steps. 